Is my microphone? Can everybody hear me? Because even with the windows open, right? So um, I, I get to talk. Could you maybe, I know, it's, I know it's warm. I'm sorry about it. But if I can't hear myself talk, it's um, OK. Well, good afternoon, everybody. This is going to be, because it's a tough day, it's warm in here. Um, it's warmer than usual in the Netherlands. I am from the Netherlands, so I know it usually rains around this time of year. Um, so this is a maybe slightly more lightweight talk than the other talks you've seen so far. Maybe, I'm not sure, it depends on what you saw. So um, just by a show of hands, who of you is in, a, let's say, an Agile project? Or in an Agile team? Or That's less than I expect. I would say I would like expect like 99% to be. Who of you is in a Scrum team? Oh, sh who of you is a certified or a professional Scrum master? Oh, you even dare to admit it. That's pretty cool. OK, so let's start. So this is basically a talk. So, so I've, I've been doing Agile for over 20 years now. Um, so I'm fed up with stand-up meetings. Um, it's not that they're not good. I just don't like them anymore. The same goes for retrospectives. The same goes for lots of these ceremonies that we tend to have in Agile, and especially in Scrum projects. So uh, to make it clear, I'm not against Scrum. I did this talk uh, a couple of days ago in, um, in Belgrade. And uh, the talker before me was Jeff Sutherland. So I waited for him until he left the room before I started talking. So I might say a bit of things, some things about Scrum, though. So yeah, my microphone's off. So anyway, here we go. So this is me. I am Sander. Um, I'm basically a dad, uh, which is my most important occupation. It's in the end, basically, but it should be in the start, because I have three kids. There are 23 and 19 and 14. Two of them live sort of full time with me. One of them is a drummer. I live in a small house in Utrecht, so having a drummer on board is not the most best way to make friends with your neighbors. Um, and in my spare time, I'm basically, well, um, I'm basically a programmer. I've been writing code since I was 14, so that's about 62 years now or something. Um, I do agile stuff, and I usually take on CTO, chief architect roles at companies. So does my current role is being the chief architect for a company called QB. Um, and QB is an IoT company. They make tone the thermostat that Ineco has, and they do lots of smart stuff with their data that they collect. For instance, they can predict when your boiler breaks down or when you turn on your washing machine and it's not efficient, stuff like that, right? Those are the services they deliver. By the way, this is my website, my Twitter tag, my email address if you have any further questions. Um, um, oh, what do I else do? Uh, I speak a bit, I uh, travel around the world a bit, I write a bit. I'm actually writing two new books, one on microservices, which is a much more technical book, and one about the subjects that we'll touch today. Oh dear, there's even more people coming in now. It gets really, really warm, right? So, as you all know, and as you all have seen today, is that the times are changing, right? Now, the thing is, Bob Dylan said this in 1964, right? And that's a long time ago. Time has changed a lot since then. And the thing is, it changes faster and faster and faster. I'll show you some examples of that. For instance, if you look at Moore's law, um, you might think this is a linear line, right? Moore's law says that the number of transistors in a dense integrated circuit doubles approximately every two years. This is not a linear line. This is an exponential line. Right? That means the possibilities we have as technologists, as developers, they grow and grow and grow and grow. Right? Now, let's say you would order, if you would have ordered a computer in 1954, let's say at Amazon, um, it had looked a bit like this, right? This computer has less power than my mobile phone today. It looks like a big piano, but it's a computer, actually. Now, when I started programming, we had computers like this. Does anybody still recognize these? Or you're all younger than I am, right? So if I'm probably the oldest guy, well, except for you maybe, but outside of that, I'm probably the oldest guy in the audience. That's crap, basically. I'm only 52, guys. This is an IBM 51. What? Really? So what's your birthday? First of August. And I'm older, right? I'm from the 7th of January. So, <laughs> See? Anybody older? Cool. So you, you recognize this one, right? It's an IBM 5150. The black thing there is basically where you put in the floppy disks. Well, you've never seen a floppy disk. I know they look like the save icon, but they're actually there <laughs> to store data. I could write code on this thing at home, right? Basically, I started out with a Commodore 64 having 36K bytes free to write code. That's how I started. 
Um, but this was a big change because it allowed us, not on the five computers that we had in the country, but at home or in our own department to write code. And then, basically, everything changed again. Sort of like 2006, 2007, when Amazon and later Google and Microsoft came out with this cloud thing, right? Now, this cloud thing changed everything, basically. Because what it did, it allowed us to write code or store data on somebody else's computer. We did not have to take care anymore about these computers where we ran our software and where our data was. And that changed things big time, right? I'll show you some things for that. So it basically disrupted everything, and it keeps on disrupting everything. And as a result, we need to start doing things differently. Now, let me give you some example. Do you know um, the time it takes for technologies to reach 50 million users? Maybe you've seen this one before. Like airplanes, for instance, took 68 years before 50 million people flew an airplane. Television took like 22 years. I started out with a black and white television at my parents' place, right? It had three channels. Well, originally it had even two, right? We didn't get any foreign channels. There was no Netflix. It didn't exist. And from there, it got shorter and shorter and shorter. Like, Twitter took two years to get the 50 million users. Of course, they're now back at like 10,000 users, but, well, active users, that is, um, except for the bots. Um, but if you look at modern technologies, Pokemon Go took 19 days, right? How is that possible? Well, basically, because we all have computers in our pockets, and our kids have computers in their pockets as well. So the adoption rate of technology Inspired by the cloud, basically, because it's running elsewhere, um, the, the things you can do, it's humongous, right? If you look at Netflix, for instance, Netflix is a fairly big company, right? They have like 150 million subscribers. They have no data center. They have around 10 ops engineers. 10, right? Can you imagine Netflix having only 10? I think at QB you already have 10, right? And we're a smaller company than Netflix. Well, most of us are probably, right? So it changes fast. And you can see that in any industry. To give you an example, we'll start in the fintech industry. This is the fintech landscape of startups in the Netherlands in 2018. There are 430 companies in this picture, right? What if one of them decides, let's build an online bank. Let's deploy it on Amazon. Um, well, we'll use uh, DynamoDB, we'll write some Node.js stuff, we'll write a front end in React, done. Can you do that? Become a bank? Yes, you can, right? In this, with a small team, let's say five people in about a year, you're basically there. Well, all you need to get is a permit, that's harder, but anyway. The rest of, writing the code is easy, basically, right? Uh, my girlfriend works for a company, there's a guy on his own writing an online bank. It took him about a year, and he's almost done, including blockchain and everything you can think of. Well, he's only written the mid office, by the way. But. So are there banks who do that? Yes. In the UK, there's a bank called Monzo who does that. In Germany, there's a bank called N26. And they're pretty cool because they have transparent credit cards. <laughs> Isn't that cool? So you know what the, um, so one of the sponsors here, their CEO, <laughs> um, he says, well, basically, it's not the startups they were frightened of. It's when the Amazons of this world started to move in, right? Now, Amazon is moving in. Because in Germany, you can already get a loan at Amazon. I'm not sure if we do it here already, but we don't even have an Amazon.nl yet, so um, I guess we're not important enough. But this is where stuff gets different, right? And companies like Apple move in. So Apple starts his own credit card, right? And it's pretty cool as well, because it doesn't have anything on it, right? Your name isn't on it. It doesn't have a number. I don't know how to do it, but it's pretty cool, actually, even though I don't like Apple. Um, so what if other companies are coming into the industry as well? What if you're in fintech and AirAsia says, you know what, we're going to do payments as well, because we do loads of payments, tickets and the coffee you buy on board. I hate it, by the way, when I fly and have to buy my own coffee. It's terrible. Well, the coffee's terrible anyway, but um, so this is anybody can come into this field. And only just now, about an hour ago, I read this. Facebook announces a new cryptocurrency called Libra. I think they just announced it today or yesterday. What? They're going to create their own coin? This is probably going to change as well. So the whole industry is changing, right? And this basically goes for any industry you can be in. Your industry as well. To sum it up, basically, you can say that we live in a world where everybody, anywhere, everywhere, can enter any market 
at any point in time you want to. Because it's technology. It's us as technologists, developers, that change the world, basically. And if you're in a company, in a market that is about to be disrupted, probably there is another party doing the same thing you do, but smarter and faster and, and cheaper, or even disrupting the whole business model, right? If you were a taxi driver five years ago, you were okay until Uber came along, right? If you were a hotel, you were okay five years ago until Airbnb came along. Any market can be disrupted at any point in time, right? Um, the company I work for is in the energy market. Last month, right after the day we had a strategy session, Google announced that they were going to send this new home hub to the Netherlands as well. How does that change our company? We don't know yet, right? That's the thing you need to figure out continuously. As a result, when we build software, we need to start doing things differently, even differently than you do already. You might think, oh, we're agile already. And if we're agile, we're good, right? Most people think, most managers think like, is there anybody manager here in the room? Oh, only two. Well, I'll explain it to you afterwards again, right? And um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> That went down easy. Anyway, so, <laughs> so anyway, most people think, oh, we do Scrum, so we're good. No, you're not. You're not safe even if you're doing Scrum. And if you do safe, well, you're not even agile. Anyway, so um, sorry about the safe people in the room. So what I think you should do, you should all move beyond that. Right? You're all pretty much agile. You're developers, right? So you're good at this already. So what I think we should do is we should move to actually developing small services over doing projects. The metaphor of project has never worked in our industry, the software industry, that is, right? Because it's the wrong metaphor. I'll try to show you. Also, we need to move to even shorter cycles. Like, if you have two-week sprints now, go beyond that. Can you? Yes, you can. You know how? By removing most of the ceremonies. Don't laugh. It's, it's actually it's just a true story, right? So, and you need to go to even smaller teams. Because the current teams, like six plus or minus three teams, they don't cut it anymore. And I'll explain that too. The part I won't explain today is the part about even moving to smaller components. But there's many talks on microservices here already, so I suggest visiting, well, not now, but after this talk, visiting all of the microservices talk. Okay. So these are the three topics that I will try to discuss. First of all, let's go to small services. There's an interesting model, and it's this one. Have you ever seen this before? You're a manager, right? You, you've seen it. Good, good. No, that's good. No, I'm, just, I'm not going to make jokes about managers anymore. Right? This is the Kinefin framework. This actually opened my eyes big time about how we do our work. Um, it's written by a guy called Dave Snowden. He's a professor at Bangor University in Wales. Um, and he wrote this down while he was working for IBM. He said, basically, you can distinguish four or five different contexts or zones that you could be in, right? You could be in what is called the obvious zone, which is down here. If my pointer works, it looks like I'm drunk, but it's actually the thing itself, right? So this is the obvious context. In the obvious context, if you have a problem, there is a best practice. There's no doubt there's only one practice, right? If my uh, sink is full of, of dishes, I have to put them in the dishwasher. Uh, that's the only solution. Yes, I have three kids. They're not going to do this. Um, so I have to do it myself. It's the only solution. Do it. You're done, right? This is planable. This you can say, we know what the solution is. We'll go there. We'll write it, and that's it. Or we'll just implement it or whatever you do, right? Uh, don't write your own ticketing system. There's existing ticketing systems. They're okay, sort of. And, um, and that's it. That's the best solution. Alternatively, you can be in a complicated context. In a complicated context, to a given problem, there is a set of possible solutions. And the thing you need to do is you need to analyze each of these solutions and figure out which one is the best, and from there maybe build it, test it, implement it, etc., etc. Now, these two contexts, which are on your side here, are actually the ones you can manage in the way that most companies are managed a linear style. This is where waterfall prevails, right? But unfortunately, most of us are not in there. Most of us are either in complex or in chaotic context. Now that means in a complex context, you can still set a dot at the horizon and say, this is where we are slowly heading and then experiment towards that particular goal. And with every step you take, 
Every step. No, I'm not going to sing. Anyway, so um, this is basically, it works or it doesn't. If it works, go in the same direction. If it doesn't, change direction. That's the way it works. Most of us are in fast-changing worlds, meaning there is not a predefined set of solutions anymore. We don't know how to get where we're going because every time we do something, Amazon comes up with two new frameworks or solutions or whatever they have, and you have to rethink everything again. That is where we are, right? It could be worse. If you don't have a dot at the horizon, you don't know what your point is, what your strategy is, what your vision is, or your mission, or all this other uh, marketing mumbo-jumbo you can figure out, the why and the how and the what and whatever, right? So if you don't have a particular goal to go to, you need to figure that out. The only thing you can do is take a small step, see what happens, and from there decide on what the next step will be. Now most of us are in either complex or chaotic zones. A colleague of mine, oh yeah, wait, I had this added too. So um, just to sum it up, basically, a friend of mine came up with it. He said, well, this is the zone where you can say, duh, that's the solution, right? And in the complicated zone, you could say, uh, ah, that's the one. We're going to pick that one. Now, if you're in a complex zone, it's more like, uh, pronounced right. And if you're in a chaotic zone, if you are there, we are in a company that is there, it's basically like, we don't know, we have to figure it out, right? So a colleague of mine says, basically, we are operating in a new and fast-moving market. Nobody has invented, it's, it's the smart energy market, a profitable business model for this market yet. Meaning, we have no dot at the horizon. Meaning, we can only take small steps and hoping that we get somewhere. Meaning, it's the end of projects, right? Projects are out of the door. So you have to stop, because if you are here or here, you need to tackle things differently, right? You, well, the good thing is, basically, if you look at Dave Snowden, he says, well, in a chaotic context, which is where most of you will be in, searching for the right answers will be pointless. That's, well, it's sad, basically. The relationships between cause and effect are impossible to determine because they shift constantly, basically because of new technology and new insights and whatever you might have, and no manageable patterns exist, only turbulence. That is where most of us, as developers, are in. Now, the good thing about this is, is that this chaotic context or domain is nearly always the best place to impel innovation. So if you like innovation, and most of us probably do, otherwise you wouldn't be a developer, I guess, um, that means that if you're in a chaotic context, you can innovate a lot, right? Which is pretty cool. That means that projects and um, waterfallish stuff, this actually comes from the original white paper by Winston Royce, don't work. They don't work in our industry. So if you're in a project, get out. That's the main message, I guess. If you have detailed plannings in the company you work for, find another job, right? You need to get out here because this doesn't work. It's certified not to work. What you need to do is you need to move in small steps. You need to deliver small features. You need to deliver small services. Because if you only deploy into production like once every three months, it's big. That means you need to do a lot and a lot of testing, meaning you go slower and slower and slower. In the end, your innovation will stop. The only thing you need to do is to move into delivering small services again and again and again and again. I have a lot of these actually, so this is basically to illustrate my point, is that move in small services. That also means that you will end up with, I don't know what, hundreds, maybe, well, tens of maybe hundreds of repositories and pipelines and lots of automated testing as well. And also it means that you can finally, after doing them wrong for 50 years in this field, stop doing projects, right? Wow, you're all very quiet now. Is it too warm? Well, it is, right? So let's see what is in the second step. The second step is about shorter cycles. Now, um, I suppose most of you are in like Scrum or Agile Project having two, who has two week sprints? Are there people with three week sprints? Four week sprints? People who don't have sprints? Well, I don't have sprints either, but that's because I sort of abolished them, basically. But I'll tell you the story. So, what about shorter cycles? Now, most people I meet in this industry, and I go to a lot of events, I go to a lot of clients uh, um, to do coaching, and if you go to all of these, let's say, agile events, my tip, don't go there, by the way, they're horrible. 
It's sort of like this. People say, yes, agile means scrum, right? And, and a bit of Jira. Um, <laughs> and that's it. And it isn't, right? Agile was not about doing scrum right. Agile was about adding value continuously. It was about learning stuff continuously, about improving continuously. That is what Agile, in my mind, is about, right? So it doesn't mean if you do Scrum right that you're Agile and that you're equipped for this new world that is changing faster than we can think of, right? Also, what I see is that a lot of people come in from outside of the industry into our field and, and do mastery stuff, Scrum mastery stuff, right? Now, if you would ask somebody who does, um, I don't know, martial arts like karate. So my girlfriend did karate for quite a while. Um, and she was quite good at it. She was like a uh, 17 times Dutch champion. By the way, I didn't know that when I started dating her. <laughs> She's kind of dangerous. And I said, well, how long did it take you to become a master? She said, well, actually, I'm not a master. 17 times Dutch champion, right? I'm not a master, but I did train for 10 years, five times a week, three hours a day. That's when you get to become a master. Now, there's this other mastery that we occasionally meet uh, is that... Well, you get the point, right? So that of Scrum Mastery, right? You do the two-day training course. You do 30 multiple choice exam questions. And whether you are a history teacher, um, a physiologist, or an archaeologist, you can become a Scrum Master. And then you get to solve all of the problems we have in the industry, right? Even though you've never seen a line of code in your life before. Now, I'm not sure that works. Because what will happen if you start doing things like that? It becomes really dogmatic, right? You see people like that solving problems in a way that you might think, well, that's probably not the best way. So I'll read it to you. The dogma is the established belief or doctrine, so scrum, held by a religion, it's probably scrum org, or a particular group or organization. Um, it's authoritative and not to be disputed, doubted, or diverged from by the practitioners. That means you have to do stuff exactly as it is in the scrum guide. Now, the Scrum Guide is far from complete, by the way, if you want to do projects or even move beyond projects because it's basically meant to do products. So, the thing is, if you have become a Scrum Master or whatever certification you have, that doesn't mean that you're equipped to solve all the problems in the industry. These are my girlfriend and my son. Um, there, there we went skiing and I said, well, I'm going skiing because I know how to do that. I'm, I'm old, I'm not going to learn snowboarding anymore. They started snowboarding. It took them three days, and they couldn't even go downhill. And they said, you know what, for the last couple of days, we'll just ski. Because it is really hard to learn new stuff, right? The same goes for coaching projects or coaching teams. It's hard, basically, right? So that means if you do alpine skiing or agile coaching or scrum mastery or writing code or whatever you do, it takes a lot of knowledge and experience. So that means that if you have a project that says, oh, we have a sprint, where at the end of the sprint, um, um, we had some work left, and this is your second sprint, and your third, and your fourth, and your fifth, and your sixth, and you have work left at the end of every sprint, and your project manager, this is an actual project from Brussels, basically, in Belgium, um, and, um, and the project manager says, you're terrible. You don't know how to estimate your work. True. Also, you don't know how to do your work because you have work left every sprint. And by the way, we only have three sprints left. That means for the remaining three sprints, you need to be three times as productive as you are now. And then he concluded that the teams that were on the project would never gain that productivity. That's true, by the way. So he hired 300 developers from India. This is a true story, by the way. And... Um, <laughs> Of course, the project failed miserably, not because they're from India, because adding 300 people to a project that's already failing doesn't really work, right? That's Brooke's law. Adding more resources to a late project makes the project even later. And then he got fired. And the project failed, of course, so that's it, right? So the question is, do these sprints actually matter? Do you actually need to do sprints if you want to be agile? And the answer is no, because if you look at the Agile Manifesto, as old as it may be, it basically says continuously delivery of, so, uh, of valuable software, right? It doesn't say, well, every three weeks, every three weeks, every month. It says continuously. That means you have to put stuff into production as fast as you can, as often as you can, right? 
not uh, like in this particular graph that I have here. This is a nice research. Like in 2014, 13% of the people who voluntarily filled in this inquiry said they never went into production with anything. <laughs> I have no idea how this works, by the way. But the thing is, you have to move into delivering as fast as you can, as often as you can. That also means that all of the ceremony that you add having sprints, like these enormous planning sessions and sprint kickoff and whatever you do, um, and uh, um, refinement sessions, they can go out of the door. Because the only thing you need to do is figure out what are the items that we want to work on, and what's the most important item to do now, work on it, move it from left to right on the board. By the way, I'm not saying here use Jira. This is an example, right? Could have been post-its on a wall as well, but they fell off. Um, so the only thing you need to measure is how fast can we get the items from left to right? Because that's the only value that actually matters. How fast can I get stuff into production? And the faster you go, the more agile you are, basically. That changes perspective a bit. And by the way, if you think, hey, it looks like Kanban, well, it looks like Kanban, except that Kanban only says visualize your process and improve from there. It doesn't tell you what the process is. So you need to figure out what the process is yourself. By the way, I found this board game in a shop called Kanban. The description on the back is horrible. Um, but go out and read it anyway. So, and if you want to move to continuous delivery, actually continuous delivery, that means you have to automate everything. Everything in the kitchen sink. This is a Jenkins pipeline. And I don't care if you use uh, Jenkins or GoCD or Bamboo or TeamCity or whatever you do. All I'm trying to figure out is say, automate everything. This is a literal pipeline from one of my clients saying, OK, as soon as I check in my code, the build kicks off. My unit tests run. If they're OK, we'll send it off to SonarCube. That repeats the unit test, basically, and checks for the amount of code coverage, checks for my cyclomatic complexity. If that's OK, we'll package it into a Docker, uh, uh, Docker image, which is deployed onto an environment where we run API tests or integration testing. From there, it's deployed again to the next environment, um, and there, all the tests between these components and all the other components take place. From there, it goes to acceptance. There, automatically, performance tests are uh, uh, executed. And if they're OK, it goes into production. This whole process takes about five minutes, right? So from the time I check in my code, including the unit tests, of course, because everybody writes unit tests, right? Uh -huh. I'm not going to do a show of hands, because it will be terrible. Anyway, so. That basically means it takes five minutes to put something in production, actually in production. Right? Now, if you can go at this speed, that means you can actually deploy hundreds of times per day, having tested everything automatically, you're very, very agile. Um, for instance, this example, this is one of the microservices at a particular company. It has like 3,000 lines of code and a code coverage of 97, 79.2%, right? 342. Uh, unit tests on that particular piece of code. That's quite a lot. That's one for every 10 lines of code, I guess. Right? So you need to automate everything if you go in this direction. And you need to go in this direction because you want to stop do projects, right? Now it's getting really warm. You're like, oh, I'm at, I'm at the wrong company now. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. Well, let's investigate the third part, which is the part about the teams. Now, Agile, um, was actually, so the word Agile came from the Agile Manifesto, which was written down in 2001, um, which is 18 years old, right? In those 18 years, the world has changed quite a bit. And there's lots of issues that the Agile Manifesto, although it's a brilliant piece of work, and I love it to death, doesn't solve. Current day issues we now have that we didn't have back then. For instance, there is a low availability of what managers like to call Resources. I mean people, right? So, um, so if you look at, so this is a Dutch resource being conducted last year. It says basically in Dutch, so if you're Dutch, you're okay. If you're not, well, um, I can translate it for you. It says very tight market, right? It is very hard to find the right people. Company uh, women I work for, we've been trying to find Java developers for, for what, over two years, I guess now? It's hard, right? We cannot get to the right people. As a consequence, all of us need to become T-shaped, or pie-shaped, as in pie with two strong uh, uh, um, 
Uh, that's of our expertise, but you need to know one thing really good, it's your sweet spot, and a lot of other things you need to take into account as well. You need to learn about how AWS works, about how Azure works, about domain-driven design, about microservices, about continuous delivery, about automated testing, about testing frameworks, whatever, right? There's lots of stuff you need to know now as a developer that you could say, well, there's a specialist there 10 years ago. They're not there anymore. We need to know everything. That means we need to learn continuously. Also, if you live in this particular country, or most countries actually, this is a picture I took on the highway to Amsterdam a couple of weeks ago. Right? Uh, if you look at the other side of the road, I'm in traffic. This is five lanes going from Utrecht to Amsterdam. On the other side of the road, there's the same amount of people getting stuck in traffic in the opposite direction. And you can ask yourself, what is the point in that, right? Could we just stay at home and read our emails at home and then go to work? What if 20% of us would do that, right? We would actually solve all traffic problems in the country, I guess. And the third thing is, despite that most managers think that we work best from 9 to 5, our minds doing creative work, they don't work like this. They work a bit like this, right? Uh, managers might think you work from 9 to 5 and taking a break and don't think during your break. But the blue line is actually basically how we think. I get most of my ideas when I'm in my car or in public transport or even in the shower or while I'm having breakfast. That means I need to be able to figure out when to do my work at the best time that I can do it, basically when I have these ideas, which is not always between 9 and 5. So we should change basically our work ethic. And it changed a lot. Also, well, you might know that as developers, we find communication often hard, right? It is hard, basically. It is very hard to understand different people. If you listen to Bruce Dickinson this morning, he basically said the same, right? He said, well, it's not always easy finding a v an accurate answer to a question you ask, or the other way around, to give an accurate answer. And that's because communication is hard. So what do these people in Agile projects do? They come up with all sorts of meetings. Why? Why? I've th the best architect in my company, he's always gone. He sits next to me, officially, but I never see him because he's always in a meeting. Why is he doing actual work, right? The thing is, we have too much of these ceremonies, even in Agile, right? So we should cut down on this stuff, right? Now, if you work in smaller teams, instead of saying teams of 9 to 12 to 15 people, if you would just be able to work with two other people, you would save a lot on this communication. You could save a lot on all these terrible meetings, actually. That means, in my point of view, we don't need more communication, as a lot of people propose. We need better collaboration. That means we need smaller teams to do that, smaller than we are used to right now. That also means like stuff like these full-day refinement sessions. Do you like them? Do you have them? Do you like them? Not particularly much, right? None of us usually do, right? They're boring. A lot of people in the room, a lot of people in the room have nothing to say and they just sit there until they get to do the t-shirt sizing exercise or the planning poke and then they wake up, right? Um, and I think we should abandon this. If you move to a continuous flow, doing item by item, the only thing you need to take into account with, let's say, two to three people who work on it is that particular item. From the point in time that you pick it up the backlog, which could be any point in time, at any day, you only need to worry about that item. That's the item you need to discuss with the two other people you're working on it, not with the whole team. That really doesn't add too much value, right? And then there's one thing I really have to debate. You are all in open floor plans, right? Do you like it? No. <laughs> we don't. You know what happens? Um, this is the golden opportunity if you are producing noise cancellation headphones, right? If you're Sony, you love open floor plans because everybody is buying these and everybody's sitting there. The only way left to communicate, if I have to talk to somebody who's sitting next to me, there's a guy called Jurgen, he always had his headphones on, I message him on Slack. <laughs> and he's sitting next to me, right? That's not a proper way to communicate. Basically, open floor plans kill your productivity. There's plenty of research being done. So if you are in an open office space, find the research, go to your manager and say, dude, this is, or girl, this is not working. I need to be able to concentrate. I need to be able to focus on my work, right? 
Um, and the next big thing, of course, is autonomy. Now, autonomy is interesting. This is my 19-year-old drumming son. And um, after high school, he took a year off. And he's like, Dad, I have no clue what to do. I said, well, go figure it out. It's your life. Good. This is giving autonomy as a parent, right? Which is really hard. It's basically the same as giving autonomy to a team. Uh, maybe a bit harder, even. Uh, so figure it out. And he found a study. He went to study here in Amsterdam doing politics, philosophy, and economics. After a month, he said, Dad, I'm going to quit. I was like, okay. And his mom was like, no, you cannot quit. You have to at least do it half a year. And I'm like, dude, follow your heart, right? So he agreed with me, of course. And he stopped. And he said, I want to become a professional drummer. Now, that was like nine months ago. Um, and in the meantime, he got admitted to a conservatory. So he's, he's practiced really hard. And we gave him the freedom to figure it out himself. That is really hard to give somebody just enough autonomy so they can rule their own life. It's not easy. Because for most people, being autonomous or self-organizing teams means you have to go out of your comfort zone, right? This is not the zone that we want to live in because we have to get out and figure out how to do stuff. Usually, if I say to teams, you're self-organizing, now you're autonomous. The first question they'll ask me is, what do you want us to do? <laughs> Which is not the right question, right? So what I figured out is this is extremely hard. It's basically, I can tell you, if you want to ask me how to draw an owl, I can do the first two circles, but that's it. The rest of it, you have to figure out yourself. That means autonomy, it's good. Because having people make decisions at the right level in organizations, that's extremely good. But it doesn't mean this. This is at Zappos, actually, in the US. Would you want to work in an office like that? No, I wouldn't, basically. Um, but you think this is only in the US? Where do you see the next picture? You know where this is? It's not IKEA, by the way. This is my girlfriend's leg in a job interview for a serious management role at a Dutch retailer. I'm not going to tell you which one, but they're in Rotterdam. And they have a blue logo. No, I'm not going <laughs> to. This is, she's in a meeting room, up to her knees, filled with balls, right? That has nothing to do with autonomy of self-organization. This is overdone. Even though I like the company and order lots of stuff there, the only thing I figured out to be more autonomous means... Um, if I put less rules on my teams, just enough to set a little bit of boundary, they're better off. And I came to that conclusion when I was in, um, in Indonesia, actually, last year. So I visited this city called Medan, which is a huge city. I have three million people in it. And um, I was in a taxi, or in a car, actually, that picked me up, because I have to drive all across the island to go somewhere else. And, um, and, and this is where we are crossing a road. Remember, this is about autonomy and self-organization, right? Do you see all the traffic lines, all the traffic signs, and the, the lines on the road? You see them? They're not there, right? There isn't a single sign on the road. Actually, if you look at the traffic light, it says both red and green at the same time. <laughs> what does that mean, right? Still, we cross the road. So what happens here, right? The question is, what do these people do? What do they do? They communicate, right? They pay attention. That is what they do. And they do that by themselves. And they have to because there's no rules. And still, we got to cross the crossroads safely. Which is probably coincidence, but um, <laughs> still, the idea is good, right? I'll show you the crossroads around the corner from where I live. It looks like this. <laughs> Not every day, but it happens. Because there's lots of regulations and lots of traffic lights and signs. If you go through the country in the Netherlands, you'll find signs on the roads every 10 meters. We're over-regulated, which means people stop to think. And that is basically what we need to do. We continuously need to think about how we are doing stuff and what we are doing. Also, the next thing is, you know this, right? You know there's a good solution to this? There is. No estimation, right? The thing is, and I'll, sh I'll explain it to you by showing you the law of large numbers. And this is a very interesting theorem. It basically says, um, the law of large numbers describes the result of performing the same experiment a large number of times. According to this law, the average of the results obtained from a large number of trials should be close to the expected value. And you might think, what on earth does that mean? Late in the afternoon in a warm room in Amsterdam. It basically means that if you estimate, let's say on a scale from 1 to 5, and you estimate 100 items, and you take the average, what do you think it will almost certainly be? Around 3. So if you know that already, 
Why spend all the effort in doing stuff like, um, I don't know what, planning poker, t-shirt sizing, right? It does not add any value. It's nice to do the first three times, but after having seen this a hundred times, and every sponsor coming up with their own deck of cards to do planning poker, I sort of say, well, just count the stuff, right? If you just count the stories, it's the same as doing estimates because you get to the average. It means you're estimating on a scale from one to one, right? So it just adds up to the average. So you can basically stop doing all these estimation techniques at low level because they don't add value. So you can quit doing these. Also, again, there's the red sprints, of course. There was a company actually I worked for that actually called them red sprints. That is just terrible, right? So um, you know what to do? You can just stop doing these because this is a ceremony that we think is mandatory in being agile, and it's not. You can go beyond this stuff. You can go figure it out yourselves, right? Also, the thing is that software development has become way too complex. Having a team of six people, plus or minus two or three, whatever you think is current, uh, doesn't cut it anymore. If you look at what Esker Dijkstra says, the famous Dutch computer scientist, he says, the programmer has to be able to think in terms of conceptual hierarchies that are much deeper than a single mind ever needed to face before. He said this in 1986. He basically says, this field is the most complex field you can ever be in. That means... Building software does not fit anymore in a single person's head. That means you have to collaborate with other people. But the less people you can collaborate with, having a small team, the better it is. Right? Working with two people or three people is much more efficient than working with 20 people. So yes, small teams are good, right? Um, but still, we need to have a lot of knowledge in place. If you look at one of my client's previous code bases, they have like 9 million lines of COBOL. And they have 3 million lines of PHP. I don't know which one is worse, but um, <laughs> I could take a guess, though, but I'm not going to do it. So they had to maintain this with 20 developers. I asked the developers at my current client to actually come up with a list of technologies that they are using. It's this. They have like 40 developers on board, max, right? How do you maintain all of this stuff? Well, you don't, basically, because it's too hard. And then, well, the good thing is, if you start working in smaller teams, even smaller teams than you're working now, every work item that you might pick up from your backlog continuously actually only requires a small subset. So if we are all T-shaped, you can do a single work item with two or three people and then move on to the next item and then change maybe um, the way your team, your small team is composed. Change it all the time for every work item, which is a much more effective way of doing stuff. I'll give you one more problem we have, is that the framework, and I don't mean Spring, I mean the Agile frameworks, they don't actually cut it for you. Because the thing is, my conclusion is, you always have to think for yourself, right? So yes, small teams are good, really small teams. It doesn't mean that you actually have to do all the ceremonies that your Agile framework, whatever you might think, probably Scrum, is telling you to do. Because they were put there in place how can something be a best practice that was written down 20 years ago? That doesn't mean we haven't learned anything since, right? And we did. We learned a lot of things. So we can move beyond that. And if you think that, oh, yeah, we need all this stuff because we need to scale agile, I couldn't care less, basically. That's why I don't like working for big companies. So if you are in the field for saying, oh, we need um, discipline agile delivery, which is one of the enterprise agile approaches, how many roles do you think are in there? Well, a lot, actually. That's terrible, right? How can you deliver software if this is your setup? Or it could be even worse, you could do SAFE. Is anybody of you in a transi transformation towards SAFE? Quit. <laughs> I'll show you why, right? This is, my, this is my annual quiz. It's called, where's the customer? I'll show you the picture from SAFE. I think it's 4.0. And you have to answer where the customer is, right? This is the picture. Where is the customer? I found it, by the way. It's on the right side there in the middle, right? <laughs> it's the dude being hit by a train. <laughs> so does it add agility? No, it doesn't, right? Um, and also, there's companies, and I know companies that are also here, that are trying to copy the Spotify model. Who of you is? You know that the Spotify model was written specifically for a company called Spotify, right? 
that grows like 800% every year, doubles their number of people every year for every six months or whatever they do. Also, they wrote this down in 2014. That is five years ago, right? That means if you are implementing something they wrote down is, was the way they worked then, and you're saying, oh, we're going to do this now because it fits perfectly for us, it won't because basically you're not Spotify. Well, unless you work for Spotify. But then again, if you work at Spotify, it has changed already because it's five years down the road. They have learned, right? And so should you. You shouldn't be standing still at some framework that you might implement and think, oh, we're safe now. Oh, wow, that's not a good example. Oh, we're doing Scrum, so we're good for the rest of our lives. You're not going to be good for the rest of your lives. What you need to figure out is that you cannot just copy somebody else's model and think it works for you. You have to figure out your own way of working, right? And that is probably different from any one of these existing frameworks. It's up to you. And in the end, this is probably the most... The, the smallest approach I can think of is meaning you get to work, you have a conversation about the one item you're working on, you do some work, you deliver it into production, automating the shit out of it, go home, have dinner with your family or your friends, and come back the next day. That's about it. Right? This is the only approach you need to have. By the way, if you do that, you can basically stop doing projects. I'll get to the retrospective, right? Which is, well, every project needs to have a retrospective. So this is it. So, the thing is, we have never been in this field in complicated or obvious zones, right? Because everything in this field changes continuously and is changing faster and faster. Tomorrow it will change faster than it did today. That means we are in complex or chaotic zones, meaning there's no projects, there's no waterfall that helps you. There's no framework that if you implement it will work for you. You need to figure out how to do this yourselves. So, there is a conference I was in Romania um, last year, and I, c I could win a T-shirt, basically. So I, I went in to join this uh, multiple-choice question. Nat Stark is a senior product owner. Which approach do you think he will recommend when refining the product backlog? Very much tuned towards Scrum, right? And I look at the answers and say, well, basically anyone is a good answer, depending on your situation. And they're like, no, it's B or C. I don't remember anymore, right? They were very stuck on what they were doing, and you need to get beyond it. You need to stop implementing somebody else's model. And if you think, as a developer, you cannot do that. You cannot move beyond where you are now, right? Because you're only a developer, or you're only a QA engineer, or you're only a manager, right? It's, uh, no, I'm not joking, so it could be. You, if you want to change, it's you that's got to do it. It's your life, right? If you want to change, you need to. I actually tried this out on the parking spot at my son's football team, and I was the first one to arrive. That never happens, by the way. So I parked my car in the wrong direction, and everybody followed, <laughs> right? So as technologists, right, even though we might look a bit like this usually, this is probably at a Java conference too, um, we are the ones that change the world, right? It's because we change things. It's because technology evolves so fast, and we are basically the only ones who can keep up with that. So that means, as a result, you will never can stop learning, right? Have to figure out your own way in doing this. For every team, every organization, it's going to be different than for any other one. Also, we're in the best industry there is, right? Because this is the most fun industry I've ever known. That's my conclusion. Um, I'm like two minutes over time. So for me, that's pretty good, actually. Uh, by the way, stop doing projects. <laughs> they don't work in our industry. Um, I have a QR code in here if you want to go to the handouts, which are actually longer than I did today. Thank you for indulging me in this warm weather, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.